uh, recording. So it's our pleasure to have uh, Angela Jose Lumba as our today's speaker. So Angelo is a senior researcher at the Asian Development Bank, particularly specializing on input output analysis and the global value chains. So Angela is also a data scientist for the uh, Pulse Lab of the UNDP Philippine Country Office, where Angela covers the project on climate finance, circular economy, and the use of the non-traditional data for development. So Angela is a doctor candidate for economics at the University of the Philippines uh, Dilemma, uh, where An uh, Angelo also obtained his uh, master degree of art in the same discipline. Um, so his talk today is combining input output analysis with uh, network analysis to assess uh, sustainability. So the presentation will be about uh, uh, 30 minutes, between 30 to 40 minutes, and it will be followed with the Q and the A for 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, Angela, the, um, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Kishan. So uh, once again, uh, good evening, good morning to everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be uh, the speaker for this webinar. And let me just share my screen. So uh, as you've probably seen in the flyers, uh, this uh, talk of mine will focus on input-output analysis and network analysis, particularly combining them uh, for answering questions related to, state, to sustainability. So the outline is as follows. I'll just begin with explaining the motivation behind uh, the study and uh, followed by fundamentals of network analysis. Notice that I'm not including any fundamentals for IO analysis here, uh, since of course I'm in a group with IO experts. And uh, finally, we transition towards use cases of IO and network analysis combined in addressing uh, sustainability matters. So let's first try to answer the following questions very quickly. Uh, why do we assess sustainability in an economy? And why do we combine network analysis and IO analysis in an attempt to uh, answer these questions? It's probably no uh, secret to everyone that for developing countries like the Philippines, uh, the pursuit for a green recovery and sustainability is still quite uh, a big deal for us specifically or particularly uh, during these periods of recovery from COVID-19. And there are certain buzzwords like the circular economy, uh, inclusive climate change and adaptation and mitigation and green jobs uh, in any projects I'm working with, uh, whether it be uh, projects in the ADB or the UNDP, uh, these somehow always uh, are mentioned. Um, another issue in terms of developing economies is the lack of data. Uh, although we could probably, uh, in a perfect world, measure uh, industrial impacts of, uh, in terms of GHG emissions and other, any other pollutants, we don't, never, we don't necessarily have that. So oftentimes we're faced with the challenge of approximating um, these indicators uh, using the best available data we have. And in the UNDP, for example, we call that um, non-traditional uh, ways by which we estimate uh, these uh, metrics. So why one such way is by combining uh, network analysis and IO analysis. And uh, I acknowledge that IO analysis is already a useful tool in itself in analyzing the extent of uh, sustainable and green practices within industries, since uh, we can essentially track, for example, um, a particular sector's um, final demand. Uh, we in gross output, we'd be able to figure out how much of that uh, comes from dependence from quote unquote uh, target or sectors of concern like uh, mining uh, or any other um, less sustainable industries out there. However, if we integrate it with network analysis, um, we can provide additional insights for better understanding the structure of, an econ of economies. And as Xu and Liang aptly put it, um, 
if you understand how a system is structured, then you can probably figure out how it's uh, be functional or its functionality. Also, if we combine these, uh, we it allows for a deeper analysis that includes uh, getting to know the roles of sectors in an economy and uh, figuring out if, uh, say, a sector A and sector C, uh, if they do interact, um, if it affects the economy in any particular way. And lastly, uh, we're able to figure out uh, whether or not uh, such interconnectedness of sectors uh, have an effect on the overall performance of an economy. So um, in linking IO analysis with network analysis, I attempt to do it in the most natural way possible. And what I thought of as the best approach is to first discuss uh, the fundamentals of network analysis. And I go down to the, to the roots of it and establish finally in the end how IO comes into the picture. And let's first begin with terminologies. Uh, this here is a network. Uh, it's based on the 2018 IO table of the Philippines, compiled by our statistics department. And it's uh, this is a 16 industry classification IoT. Uh, there's an 80 industry classification. There's also a 240 classification. I went with um, 16 here uh, for this study for better visualization. Uh, and essentially, uh, let's first try to define what a network is. Uh, it's at the root of it all. It's just a set of points that are connected by line segments. Um, we can break this down into its very uh, fundamental components, which is composed of your nodes and edges. So the points a while ago are just your, um, what we call in network analysis as nodes or vertices used interchangeably. And the edge or the line segments that join them uh, essentially uh, give information on whether or not uh, these two uh, nodes interact. This particular uh, relationship is undirected and unweighted. Um, there's no directionality here in the picture. Uh, you're only concerned with answering the question on whether A and B have a relationship or not. Do they interact? Um, you don't care about the extent of information uh, being passed or extent of transactions that exist between the two of them. And you also don't care where um, the interaction originates. So. If you do care for those types of uh, questions, uh, you can introduce directionality in the network. And the way they're represented are just by arrowheads. And A here now uh, says that uh, it interacts with B and that interaction originates from A. So, uh, so for example, we could consider A here uh, a seller of a product and B as the buyer. Uh, we can uh, say that A sells some product to uh, B, which is another node that exists in the network. Still, though, uh, we don't really uh, care here uh, how much that transaction is. Uh, we just really want to know uh, whether or not it existed and where it originated. However, if you are concerned with the extent of the interaction, uh, you have to now include weights in the edges. And sometimes this is why we see the networks have uh, different line segments with different weights or widths. And that corresponds to the uh, characterization or of the interaction between the two. So going back to the example a while ago, um, if node A sells a product to B, so that's direction. Uh, now we can say how much uh, products uh, were sold to B, and it's 50 monetary of uh, monetary units worth of products that sold to B. And if we're dealing with the, this type of information, we're looking at directed and weighted networks. So here uh, we see just uh, generated a random graph and we don't see any uh, arrows and we also don't see any uh, arrowheads, I mean uh, weights. Uh, we have the same uh, widths among the edges. Therefore, what we're dealing here with is an undirected unweighted network. It has five nodes, these orange points here, and eight edges. Uh, it's just counting the total number of line segments that join the nodes. This can be represented in node lists, which is just a vector of the um, nodes that exist within the network, as well as the edge list, which uh, provides us information about the uh, nodes that are connected by line segments or edges. And AB here uh, corresponds to this line segment. 
and notice that in an undirected network, um, an unweighted network, we do not need to put BA in the edge list because we're treating uh, the relationship of AB the same as BA. They're just the same thing. We're just basically saying that uh, there is an interaction between the two of them. And provided that you capture all the line segments here, uh, this is what the edge list would look like. That edge list and this network as a whole can be represented in uh, what we call as the adjacency matrix and network analysis, which is very important because um, when we feed this type of information in uh, any computing language or programming software, um, it's best to work with adjacency matrices sometimes. And if we work with tables of networks, they sometimes come in the form of adjacency matrix, matrices. And that's why uh, this representation is quite important. So the rows and columns here just correspond to the uh, nodes that exist within the network. And since this is undirected, uh, and unweighted, all the entries here will just be uh, ones or zeros. It's a binary system uh, in essence. And another thing we notice here, it's symmetric, because once again, uh, the relationship with AB captured in the edge list is just the same relationship as BA. So uh, say AB here is just BA. Uh, we do not uh, distinguish between the two of them. So uh, Adding that all up, we end up with a square and symmetric matrix. Now, if we add directions, um, what will happen here is a while ago it was eight edges. We have, of course, we'll have the same number of nodes, five, but now we're treating uh, this relationship here, for example, AB, as two different edges because now we're talking about uh, a relationship that originates from A and goes to B. That's one direct. That's one edge. And another edge is uh, an interaction that originates from B and ends up in A. So now you're counting this as two separate. Therefore, um, you can find any other uh, interrelationships here and add it all up, and we get 11 edges in total. So um, this is the old edge list. And this is the new edge list. Notice that uh, I kept on saying BA a while ago um, and how it's not included here. Now you have to include it here because um, AB. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean BA because uh, in a sense, um, A can sell to B, but that does not mean that B can sell to A. So therefore you have to specify uh, this type of information here. And now we have a longer edge list. How does it affect adjacency matrices? Well, it just uh, makes it uh, still square, but it's no longer symmetric because of just what I mentioned a while ago. Now with undirected and weighted networks, uh, we will still have symmetry, of course, um, since CB is same as BC, except that we are now giving uh, some level or a value as to the extent of interaction between the two. Um, this could be, say, the number of times B talks to C. It's the same as the number of times that C talks to B. So um, in that sense, uh, the node bit stays the same. But the edge list almost the same as the undirected one, except that there's a new entry now towards the end of each edge entry here, edge list entry, and that corresponds to the weights that um, exist uh, between the interactions from one node to the other. Uh, let's give an example here: uh, B to D. I mean, B and D uh, has a weight of three, so B D here three in this edge list. So it's also square and symmetric and from the original undirected and unweighted network. All that happened here is that uh, we now um, replace those ones with um, the weights that correspond to the uh, edges. A bit more complicated are directed and weighted networks. Um, still has, uh, I kept the same relationships as before, uh, directions except now we added weights. So we still have the same number of edges, 11. And the only thing that will differ here is adding once again, uh, new entries in each of the elements of the edge list that corresponds to the weights. Adjacency matrix will look like this. It's the almost the same as before in the directed network uh, in terms of which uh, entries in this matrix are non-zero. Uh, except that now uh, those ones have been replaced with um, 
the weights. Now, this is probably the most complicated uh, network. It's a directed weighted network that allows for self flows. So see here in this node here, uh, we have another edge here, oops. And that corresponds uh, to B interacting with itself. So we're treating this uh, edge as separate and we also count it in the total edge list. So therefore we, from 11 a while ago, uh, if we add self flows and they exist for each of the nodes that are present in this network, we will now have 16 edges in total. And the edge list will be expanded. And the way it differs from the one before is that uh, we now have um, edge, edge list elements that correspond to self flows, such as AA, uh, which has a weight of one. I didn't put the weights here because they uh, just for visual purposes. And say um, CC here has a weight of three. So it's thicker than this one. And now that we have this, um, from before, if you notice, uh, all of the diagonal entries, main diagonal entries in the adjacent matrix were zero. If you allow for self flows, of course, uh, they will now have entries here, which are non zero. And let's quickly take a look at that adjacent matrix and ask ourselves what does this resemble? If we consider those uh, nodes as sectors, columns, and rows, um, then uh, what this looks like is your typical. Uh, inter-industry transactions matrix in an IO-based economy. So that's where um, the relationship with IO and network analysis comes in. As Xu and Lang Lian aptly put it, uh, in an IO-based economy, you can essentially uh, consider it as a network wherein your nodes are your sectors and the entries in your adjacency matrix correspond to the intersector of flows, whether it be Z or um, the direct uh, requirements matrix A, or even B, or L, the Leon tip inverse. However, in I/O based networks, it's quite complicated um, because we're looking at directions, we're also looking at weights, and we're also looking at self connections or self flows. Um, but still, the spirit of network analysis can be applied to an I/O based economy because it qualifies as a network, and the basic features of a network are present in it. Therefore, you can essentially uh, use the tools that you have in network analysis and apply them to your IO based tables. So given that um, some basic basic metrics here, uh, network density, for example, this is a graph level measure that looks at the extent of connected connectivity within a given network. Um, all you're doing here is just counting the total number of edges within the network and dividing it with um, the total possible edges. So if there are five nodes, I just um, take five combination two, so there will be 10 possible edges um, given five nodes. However, um, it might not be true that, uh, that all of those edges exist within network. So in here, this is a complete graph, meaning that all of these uh, nodes are connected to each other. And therefore, uh, the density is equal to one. However, in here, uh, only these outer edges uh, show connections. Uh, the ones that uh, exist here within uh, do not exist here. Therefore, the density would be lower than 100%. So this is sometimes important for us when we're looking at, say, um, certain regional value chains. Um, some are more integrated than the other, or more connected, while some are less. And Oftentimes, a quick measure is just to measure density of those subclusters of uh, production in GBCs, and we can figure out which ones are more linked compared to the rest. So if you're looking at a very, very complicated um, network chart, sometimes you can get lost into your thoughts and you can't figure out what you can extract from um, that network um, because there's just too many lines and too many nodes. Uh, however, you're trying to answer in your mind which of these nodes here, uh, say sectors, are more uh, central in the network or play key roles in the network. Visually, you can probably do that if you're working with, say, a five node network with obvious um, uh, relationships uh, given in the graph. However, if you uh, work with bigger data, 
which is typically the case in network analysis, visual inspection is probably almost impossible. So one of the ways we uh, tackle these types of questions is by introducing centrality. And centrality uh, basically pertains to nodes uh, that are focal points in the network. And um, they answer the question, now which ones, which ones of these nodes are playing central roles in the flow of information or in the transactions that exist within the entire system. There are four um, basic and commonly used measures of centrality. Note that there's a whole gamut of centrality measures out there, but these are the four most commonly mentioned. And it's degree, eigenvector, betweenness, and closeness. These uh, centrality measures answer different kinds of research questions, and they have, because of that, different use cases. And therefore, it's important to distinguish between them. Degree uh, is the first one. It's the simplest one. All you need to do is to find out the number of edges connected to a particular node. And in that sense, it's direct influence and direct power over a given um, network. Um, Eigenvector tries to generalize that centrality measure, meaning degree centrality, by taking into consideration the extent of connections that its neighbors has. So for example, um, there are two nodes in the network, both have um, degrees of five, meaning they're connected to five uh, nodes in the network. However, the first uh, node, uh, its neighbors, or who it's connected to, are connected to no other nodes, uh, it ends there. However, the second one, um, say node B, that has also five connections, is connected to a whole list of other um, nodes in the network, meaning its neighbors. So we cannot treat the same um, nodes the same way in terms of centrality. You prefer that other node, which has neighbors that are connected to a whole lot other nodes in the network. And in that sense, uh, the intuition given by McCullough is that it's a measure of direct exposure and influence of a node and its neighbors. So in essence, it's just a generalization of degree centrality. And between this and closeness, um, there's this concept of shortest paths uh, that exist between nodes. In between this, you're trying to figure out whether your node lies on the shortest path between other nodes. Well, in closeness, um, you're looking at uh, the shortest path from your node to all the other nodes in the network and just averaging it out. Betweenness measures how much a certain node uh, plays the role of a broker or a mediator in the flow of transactions among other nodes. So for example, uh, there might be a node there that doesn't necessarily have a lot of direct connections with others, but it exists within uh, uh, position in the network that connects two key clusters in the network. So without it, uh, that bridge might be cut and therefore uh, it doesn't uh, become as um, interconnected as before. Well, closeness, because it's measuring average shortest distance, is just usually taken as a measure of efficient transactions or fast diffusion of information. Decrease centrality in an undirected and unweighted network is done simply by getting the sum of uh, given row. So for example, for um, node i, uh, all you need to do is get the adjacency matrix, get the row sum, and that's how you figure out how much uh, relationships a particular uh, node has. And in here, um, uh, you have, you're trying to look for the degree centrality of A, uh, you just need to count the number of um, edges that it has, it's three, and it's sometimes normalized to the total number of possible edges or connections that the node can have, which in this case is four, because it can also have a connection with C. So in that sense, this degree centrality is three-fourths. If you're now adding direction um, to your um, analysis of centralities in degrees, you need to figure out or be familiar with in degree and out degree. If we're interested with the node B here, in degree is just the inflow of transactions from uh, another node coming to your node of concern B. Well, out degree reports your outflows. So it's a transaction that originates from B and ends up somewhere. Apply that um, thinking and 
use the same measure of degree centrality as before um, in a directed network, and you can get in degree and up degree centralities. In in degree centralities, you're just looking at the total number of in degrees that the node has and normalizing it with the total possible number of in degrees. Uh, A, once again, is a concern here. Um, if we look at the in degrees, so uh, E uh, is connected to A, and that originates from E. Um, D is also connected to A. And therefore, um, we have two in degrees, and the total possible number of in degrees is four. So the in degree centrality of A is one half. Same concept as before, except now we're looking at out degrees. So R is a point out uh, from A to another node. So it's uh, from A to E and A to B. That's total number. And, total, and it's just two divided by four once again, which gives us one half out degree centrality. Um, when you're introducing weights, um, usually what's done is it's the same concept as before, except now it, that all you're doing is summing the row of a weighted adjacency matrix. So in this example, um, A has uh, the following weights. It has two, and it has one, and it has two. So all I need to do is just add all those weights, and I get um, five as a weighted centrality degree. And that's probably um, not uh, it's okay if you're all you're all you're trying to measure is node strength, but um, sometimes you're also concerned with the extent by which a certain node is connected. They might be weak uh, in terms of weights, but you're still very interested in how much they're interconnected or connected with other um, players in a network. So therefore, Opsal um, in 2010 uh, gave this um, uh, modification to the uh, original um, weighted degree centrality by just uh, giving uh, a product of your degree centrality uh, using the counts of connections and multiplying it with the degree centrality in terms of the strength of the connections. And you're weighting it with a tuning parameter uh, called alpha. And if you have a higher value for alpha, it means that you're giving more weight to um, strength of nodes, so the weights, um, as compared to the number of connections that it has. So uh, in this particular case, uh, the degree centrality of A uh, with alpha is 3.87. Eigenvector centrality, uh, once again, it's just a measure, it's just a generalization of uh, degree centrality, except now um, you're taking into account the degree centralities of other um, nodes that it has connections with. So how is that usually uh, done? This is a very basic um, high level representation of eigenvector centrality, at least the logical flow and how it's derived. So uh, if we let um, C E I here be the eigenvector centrality of uh, some node I, and since you're trying to uh, account for all its neighbors' um, centralities, uh, what you're doing here is you can sum up all their centralities and uh, including XJI here so that you're making sure uh, that that node, that connection exists. Uh, if, it's, uh, if that connection exists between I and J, then XJI would be one and zero otherwise. And if you're summing up all the centralities of all your neighbors, of all I's neighbors, um, and we assume that that is proportional, then in matrix form, you can express this as lambda CE is equal to ACE, which is your typical way by which um, uh, the problem of eigenvectors is uh, derived. So uh, eigenvectors are just vectors post multiplied to a certain matrix A uh, that result in the same original eigenvector as before, except that it's scaled by some uh, parameter uh, called lambda, or some scalar uh, called lambda. So this CEs here uh, will correspond to your eigenvector centralities for each of the nodes that exist in the network. And they're divided like this. 
And at some point, uh, it has to be the case that for CE to be uh, to have non-zero elements, uh, the same thing as before in getting eigenvectors, uh, this alpha minus lambda i cannot be, I mean, this a minus lambda i matrix cannot be invertible. Therefore, you need to get a uh, determinant which is equal to zero. And if you solve for um, lambda values or the eigenvalues, then uh, using that relationship established before, which is the determinant of a minus lambda i being zero, then you get uh, a list of eigenvalues of a given uh, matrix. And um, there's this power method that's used to get a dominant eigenvalue, an eigenvector that's uh, used in uh, deriving eigenvectors and realities. Um, however, in um, your software packages, um, such as Network X, you can just plug it in there and you don't need to do the iterative process of figuring out the dominant eigenvalue and eigenvectors. So in this case, um, A here, uh, this node A has the highest eigenvalue compared to the rest. Um, in terms of directed um, and unweighted networks, uh, you can extend the same in-degree and out-degree concept before, and you can derive in-degree eigenvector centralities by only looking at the in-degrees of uh, the matrix. Uh, the adjacency matrix correspond to in-degrees. And you can also do the same for out degrees uh, for the adjacency matrix that uh, takes into account the out degrees. Um, out degrees uh, measure importance by this intuitive flow. Uh, it's a node with outgoing links to nodes which have large out degrees themselves. And prestige uh, is measured by the in degree uh, eigenvector centrality because you're looking at incoming links from other nodes, which by themselves also have a lot of large in degrees. And if you um, run this, uh, you'll get uh, the eigenvectors in, in degrees for each of these nodes. And we see that A here retains the highest uh, in degree eigenvector centrality. It also happens to have the highest out degree eigenvector centrality. Um, extending OPSEL from a while ago, you can once again have a tuning of parameter that takes, to into, takes into account um, the eigenvectors, centralities that you get from uh, this original method, and then do it with the weighted version of it. And if you use uh, this particular um, modification as introduced by OPSAL, uh, we get the following centralities here in eigenvectors. So notice that um, if we set alpha uh, to 0.5, um, A no longer becomes the dominant or the most central um, node in the network. Uh, it's replaced by B because B here um, has a um, connection to C with a high strength and A, which also has a high strength. A on the other hand um, has a connection with D, which has a low strength of connections with others, and et cetera. So in terms of um, playing around with the value of alpha, it all depends on your uh, taste on whether you favor strength or um, degrees, once again. So once we're looking at uh, betweenness and closeness centrality, um, we have to figure out or know um, concepts like such path, geodesics, et cetera. So a path is just a series of um, steps from one node to another that do not repeat nodes and edges. So they have to be distinct. So for example, um, a path from A to E can be A, C, E, and it cannot be um, A, C, B, A, C, E because you're repeating uh, nodes and edges in that manner. A geodesic is one of those paths that um, gives you the shortest uh, number of steps uh, from one node to the other. So for example, for um, for you to get from A to E, um, there are two paths. It's A, B, C, E, and A, C, E. The geodesic in that sense would be the one that has the less steps, and that's A, C, E. So therefore, um, the, the geodesic from A to E is equal to two, and that corresponds to the path A, C, E. So these are very important in terms of betweenness and closest centrality. 
because that's uh, these are the key measures by which uh, they are derived. Between us is just given by this formula here. Uh, all you're doing here is um, you're counting the total number of geodesics that exist in a network. So you're counting um, across all the paths that exist in the network, say uh, from E to B, from D to C, um, from B to E, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you're going to figure out what the geodesics are. And then once you figured out all those geodesics for the shortest distances between two points or two nodes, you're going to count how many times a particular node of concern is located in between the, those geodesics. And once you do that, that's how we get between a centrality, which is um, given by this, measure, this uh, notation CBI. For closeness, um, all you're doing is you're figuring out, um, say, I'm concerned with uh, A here. I'm going to find the shortest distances from A to B, A to C, A to D, and A to E. And once I do that, uh, I get the, the summation of that, and I invert it. Because uh, what happens is um, if you have uh, a lot of steps as a node to get to other nodes, uh, CCI, if you're not inverting it, would be quite high. And that might be mistaken for it having a high centrality. Therefore, you need to invert it so that um, the more steps that it takes on average for your node to reach other nodes, then uh, the less central, central it's considered. So this is just a run um, on getting the centralities of each of these uh, nodes here. In directed networks, uh, we just have to be careful because um, when you're working with directed geodesics, um, if a certain node, say this node here, lies in the shortest path from A to E, uh, this is the path from A to E, it lies between, uh, it doesn't mean that from E to A, that that node will also exist in the shortest path. Because technically the shortest path here is this long path from E to A. And um, this node here, is not located anywhere in that geodesic. So with that in mind, uh, between its centrality um, uses a different uh, normalizing uh, measure. It's uh, n minus one times n minus two um, as compared to n minus one times n minus two over two in an undirected network. Because you're now considering um, two separate paths. Uh, a, and a to B is different from B to A. So, et cetera, et cetera. So you're now looking at uh, two more, uh, two times the original number that you're working with. On the other hand, closest centrality is often only, con uh, it only often considers paths leading to a node and not paths originating from it to everywhere else. So in that sense, you're only looking at the end degrees, uh, the, the paths that uh, point towards or going that goes to A. And this is how we've derived. Um, in undirected and weighted networks, uh, the basic question is whether or not betweenness and closeness are applicable to these types of networks. And let's see if they are. Uh, consider we have a path from A to B. So uh, there are three total paths from A to B. That's A to B, A, C, B, and A, B, E, D. Um, in a binary network, um, A, B would be the shortest path because it's literally one step from A to B. However, in a net weighted network, that might not necessarily be true because uh, these might indicate the strength of connection. So A, B, E, D, uh, A, B, E, D might be uh, longer in a sense compared to A, B, or oh, that's A, D, E, B rather. However, uh, these uh, weights here might correspond to uh, strength of connections. And if they're stronger, it might be the case that uh, the transmission of information is faster compared to one that has a weaker strength. So in that sense, uh, we need to consider weights when looking at shortest paths. And the way that it's addressed is a combination of an algorithm by Dijkstra and Newman and Brands and it's basically represented as this. It's just um, getting the same um, geodesic formula as before, except that we're now um, inverting uh, those weights. Opsil uh, made it a 
uh, further that equation and then include the tuning parameters once again to include um, the number of intermediaries that exist within um, a particular shortest path. So if we um, get the different um, between us centralities, uh, we get the following and they differ because the original once again um, is Dijkstra and Newman and Brands inverts the, the, the weights and applies the Dijkstra algorithm while Opsel um, uses a tuning parameter. So by default, we should be different from each other. So we're visiting centrality measures. Uh, once again, there are four and each of these uh, measures correspond to different use cases as well as different research questions. So uh, those centrality measures have been uh, extended to IO analysis and the two are married in several studies that I've looked at in the past. This is once again the Philippine IO table and it has a network density of one. That means that all of the nodes that exist within this network, all the industries are connected to each other. And there are 16 in total. Um, total nodes therefore correspond to 16 and the edge of this is quite high because it's because uh, there's all uh, relationships between all nodes. So what I did here was in trying to answer sustainability questions, I got the PSA uh, IOTs from for 2018, and I also got greenhouse gases um, total uh, at the economy sector level from the OECD. The Philippines is not part of the database, so what I did was I just got uh, the world average uh, for the sectors, and it's 21 sectors, so I needed to map it back to the 16 industry classification through fuzzy matching. And lastly, um, I just got an estimate uh, from the World Bank of the total uh, in 2018 greenhouse gas uh, emissions for the Philippines. And based on that, I got uh, greenhouse gas emission multipliers. And the ones that had the highest multipliers, this is based on IO analysis. The, these are just uh, multipliers uh, taken from, um, uh, from well, the IO framework. And I got the following sectors of concern. It's uh, electricity, steam, water, and waste management. With the highest uh, GHG emission multiplier, followed by mining and quarrying, transportation and storage, agriculture, forestry, and fishing. And um, one way by which uh, our clients sometimes approach us and ask uh, questions of sustainability is uh, framed like this. Um, can you identify any sectors of concern in your in the country, in the Philippines, and see if they play key roles in um, the entire working inner workings of the economy? And in that sense, um, you can perform IO and network analysis combined to answer that question. Um, the first, one of the very first uh, ways by which uh, graph theory was introduced in IO analysis can be seen um, in qualitative IO, it's called. Uh, this one's from Miller and Blair. Um, all it does is it performs a Boolean transformation on either your Z or A matrices, and you're able to generate um, matrices that only have a one or zero as elements. What's frequently uh, performed is um, using a filter. And um, all you're doing here is um, if, your, if your element in the matrix is less than a filter, its value is less than the filter, then you uh, immediately uh, convert it to zero or transform it to zero. If it's greater than, then it's one. So therefore, you're able to perform a Boolean transformation and you will arrive at um, a binary network for which you can uh, implement any network analysis measures, specifically the SNA one. So in the case of um, the A matrix, uh, usually what's uh, used as a filter is just one over N. And since we have 16 networks, uh, 16 um, nodes here, uh, the filter is used is um, one over 16. So see that after Boolean transformation, this is now what the network looks like. It has a way lower density than before. It was 100% a while ago, and now it's 8.33%. And the, the concerning industries, um, which we saw from a while ago, it's uh, 0, 1, 3, and 6. Those are the node uh, indices. Um, some of them are in the middle of the path, 
while transportation and storage is atop the pack in terms of in degree. Um, however, in terms of out degree, transportation and storage is uh, relatively at the bottom, but uh, the agriculture, forestry, and fishing industry is at the top, while the rest are in the middle of the pack in terms of centralities derived from out degree. Eigenvector centralities uh, for in degrees, uh, usually, uh, if you have a high in degree centrality, it's usually positively correlated to a high or to eigenvector uh, centralities for in degrees. So therefore uh, six here, uh, once once again, is placed atop the rankings for eigenvectors. So we have a concerning sector here that uh, has a high multiplier for um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and it's playing a key role in terms of the network. Same uh, can be said for um, agriculture, forestry, and fishing, as it has a high out degree um, eigenvector centrality. In terms of betweenness, um, as we see here, uh, the sectors of concern do not play um, roles of transmitting uh, GHG emissions uh, between uh, different nodes or supply chains. Uh, so we see they only have um, zero as betweenness uh, values here. For closeness, once again, transportation and storage is atop the rankings. However, um, the other sectors of concern are either at in the middle of the pack or at the bottom. So the key findings are as follows. Uh, transpo sector is high in terms of in-degree centralities. So it receives a lot of direct requirements um, from the network. It also has a high in-degree eigenvector centrality. So that means the connections, its neighbors also have uh, high in degrees themselves. Uh, the agriculture sector, on the other hand, is uh, ranked high in terms of out degree centralities, um, given its important role in providing direct requirements. Once again, the correlation between um, out degree centrality and out degree eigenvector centrality is applicable here. As you see, it also has a high out degree eigenvector centrality. Um, all sectors of concern have zero between us centrality, uh, which means that they do not fall in the shortest paths in this network. And the transportation sector had the second highest closest centrality. Uh, if you're taking that symmetric of transaction speed, then that sector is possibly one of the most efficient. So in essence, some of the um, concerning sectors from a while ago play key roles in the network, and that might be problematic for someone who's trying to answer. Uh, or for someone who's trying to plan on how to address uh, problems of sustainability. Um, qualitative I.O. Uh, has a problem of losing a lot of information by making your network binary. Therefore, um, what's usually done is uh, you neglect that and go with weighted centrality measures as done by OpSouth et al. So I just derived the um, weighted centrality measures here. And um, in the key findings, I summarize that all these factors of concern are in the middle of the pack in terms of out degree centrality. However, there is um, this agriculture, forestry, and fishing sector, which had uh, the third highest out degree eigenvector centrality. That means that um, its neighbors, even though it, it in itself was not giving a lot of um, uh, direct requirements to other uh, sectors relative to the others, the whole network as a whole, um, it had neighbors which played key roles in terms of out degrees. The transportation sector, as well as the electricity, steam, water, and waste management sector, uh, also had relatively high in degrees and at the same time high in degree eigenvector centralities. And except for the transpo and storage uh, sector, all sectors of concern had zero betweenness. Um, and aside from that sector, transport and storage sector, um, they were at the bottom of rankings in terms of closeness. So that when you're looking at weighted centralities, um, some of your sectors of concern are still at top, although in terms of out degrees, they're not there. But we see in in-degree uh, centralities, some are there, such as this sector, as well as this one. Uh, they still do not play mediating roles as evidenced by betweenness. Um, but in terms of speedy transactions, uh, we have um, one of the sectors 
which is transportation and storage as evidence by closeness and reality. Um, another use case by which um, IO network analysis was uh, combined to study sustainability and environmental issues was by creating a uh, carbon emission transfer matrix in Sun and Al. So uh, they created this, C this matrix called CT, and each of those elements uh, correspond to the amount of carbon emission from province R to province S embodied in the interprovincial chain. So um, I use this as a template and use the, the usual way by which we decompose final demand into uh, say, sometimes you use it for value added, but in here I'm looking at um, the multiplier, I mean the coefficients that correspond to greenhouse gas emissions per unit of output. And um, I generated this G, um, G hat, um, L, Y hat matrix. And each of those elements uh, in this matrix corresponds to the GHG emission of sector I induced by the final demand for sector J's products. So given that we have here a square matrix, it's directed, we can figure out um, so and implement network analysis on it. So this is what that network looks like once you visualize it. And some of the metrics that I got here are the following. So I got in degree centralities weighted, of course, and out degree centralities weighted for directed networks also got betweenness between the two. And in that study that Sun et al. did, they only uh, looked at uh, degree centralities in between us. So I also followed that. Um, and if we um, plot uh, between us centralities here, we see that only uh, the second node, which is the manufacturing sector, uh, played an intermediary role um, in uh, in, a, in the transfer of, car of GFG emissions in producing or meeting final demand requirements for each sector. However, there's also this uh, tiny contribution in terms of betweenness by sector 11. So the manufacturing and construction sectors had the highest in-degree centralities, which means that they played a key role in inducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, in meeting final demand from other sectors. Uh, yes. And then on the other hand, uh, we have the electricity steam, water and waste management, and these other sectors which had the highest out degree centralities. And if you're looking at out degree, uh, that means that they play key roles in emitting greenhouse gas emissions for meeting final demand across the economy. And um, there's a difference between um, the, the Dijkstra algorithm as well as the algorithm that um, extends the Dijkstra by adding a tuning parameter alpha. And if you include a tuning parameter alpha, then you're considering intermediary sectors. If you're not, then you're not considering intermediary sectors in shortest, strongest paths. So um, there's a difference between the two. If you're not um, taking them into consideration, there are uh, the, you have the manufacturing, this sector, and transportation uh, registering the highest between us and charities in the network. But if you are considering um, the total number of intermediary sectors, the the results change and we see that only the manufacturing and professional and business service sectors, sectors have a non-zero between us as evidenced by this graph from a while ago. Um, this is the last use case. Uh, it's uh, looking at transmission sectors and pass-through and this was implemented by Liang et al 2016 and uh, what they were trying to figure out here is uh, how do you measure centralities, in particular between this. If in an IO network, um, you have directions, directionality, you have weights, at the same time, you have self flows. And they chose um, to go uh, and take the route of um, structural path analysis and combining that with IO analysis to identify and to create a between us based method for identifying critical trans transmission sectors of any environmental pressure of concern in supply chains. And this is the key equation used there. Uh, this is just betweenness of sector I. Um, and if you uh, perform this matrix operation, you can get uh, your uh, betweenness space method for uh, identifying emissions of sector I. 
and all you need to do is iterate it and you'll get a matrix that corresponds to all those between essentialities or rather a vector. So once you run that um, analysis, uh, you can get the between us base greenhouse gas um, emissions here. And in the Philippines, um, the manufacturing sector uh, had a high uh, value for it, um, followed by agriculture, forestry, and fishing, as well as wholesale and retail trade, transport and storage, financial and insurance activities. So um, from a while ago, uh, if you're looking strictly only at uh, multipliers uh, for greenhouse gas emissions um, using IO analysis, um, and not looking at, for example, here, uh, network characteristics and interactions with each other in a given network structure, then you might not figure out that the manufacturing sector plays a key role in um, being a transmission sector between um, supply chains with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. So as well as um, wholesale and retail trade, surprisingly, uh, is the third highest um, culprit in terms of between this, in terms of uh, creating greenhouse gas emissions as a transmission sector. And if you're able to figure out what these transmission sectors are, then you can use them as um, target sectors in strategizing any policies that you will probably want to uh, implement in the future, such as improving their production capacity, such that they have less um, input requirements from other um, sectors. And in that case, um, since they, they happen to be between um, supply chains and uh, creating a lot of GHG emissions along the way, if they become more, um, uh, they increase their productive capacity and decrease their reliance, then um, ideally uh, we would have a decreased uh, GHG emissions from these uh, transmission sectors. So if you slightly modify Liang et al, you can come up with a measure that tracks how many times a given supply chain passes through a sector of concern. So say I have um, the mining and quarrying sector, and I this is also based on structural path analysis. Uh, I want to um, figure out whether the, say, the education sector in producing its uh, final demand for whatever reason, um, and the supply chain that starts from, say, uh, transportation storage. So that entire chain, supply chain, how many times it passes through the mining and quarrying sector. Uh, this is what that metric um, is able to uh, derive or show. And I use this to um, try to show here how many times uh, these supply chains pass through uh, the sectors of concern that were uh, established a while ago. There's agriculture, forestry and fishing, um, mining, quarrying. And interestingly, some of those supply chains are not what you expected, such as education to manufacturing. It just so happens to pass through uh, a lot relative to the rest, um, uh, pass through the agriculture, forestry and fishing in producing the final outputs of manufacturing. And for many mining and quarrying, uh, we have real estate and ownership of dwellings, another um, sector that we don't necessarily uh, consider as a, a big uh, culprit in terms of GHG emissions. And uh, the supply chain that um, originates from this and ends in the final demand and final products of electricity, steam, water, and waste management pass through a lot uh, mining and quarrying. So we can continue doing that activity. And um, interestingly, you'll find some supply chains here uh, that pass through each of these sectors of concern. So um, the key transmission sectors in the economy um, as identified in the Liang methodology are manufacturing, agri and forestry and fishing, wholesale and retail trade, as well as transportation and storage. Um, being key transmission sectors uh, means that they transmit large amounts of embodied greenhouse gases through supply chains. And there are also surprising supply chains out there that are not known as key culprits for transmitting environmental pressures that uh, frequently pass through the sectors of concern we identified a while ago. And these are just some examples of that.
So the key takeaways are the following. Um, you can essentially consider a network, uh, an IO-based economy as a network, wherein you have your nodes as your sectors and your edges captured in a Z matrix. Um, it is, however, one of the most complex networks given its unique features of directionality, uh, weights, as well as um, self flows. Given that your IO based economy can be considered a network, you can apply network theory or network analysis and the methods that are uh, being uh, regularly used within the uh, subfield to input output analysis. And um, there were some use cases by which both are combined. And one is qualitative IO, and one is weighted networks. And both of these methods uh, showed that there are certain factors of concern uh, in terms of high multiplier greenhouse gas emissions uh, for meeting final demand um, that uh, ranked high in terms of centrality measures. Mm, however, um, most of these sectors uh, had very little role in being between or serving as uh, uh, mediators of trade between other nodes in the network. The manufacturing sector played a central role in the GHG emission transfer network. This is based on Sun et al. It had also had high values for all centrality measures. Um, the key transmission sectors that we identified using Liang uh, are the following for the Philippines. Manufacturing, always manufacturing comes into play uh, given um, the key dependence of um, the economy on the sector. Agri, forestry and fishing, wholesale and retail trade, as well as transportation storage are also key transmission sectors. And it's important to identify that because as Liang uh, Al said, uh, if you are able to identify the key transmission sectors, uh, you can vouch for or lobby um, some production efficiency uh, policies or policies that serve to increase their production efficiency. And through that, you can help address issues of environmental degradation, given their less reliance on intermediate input from other sectors in the network. Um, lastly, one the key finding from the pass-through frequency is that there are certain supply chains uh, which involve sectors that are not regularly known as key culprits for transmitting environmental pressures that frequently pass through sectors of concern. And as a last point here, uh, there are other more complicated measures of centrality out there, such as random walk centrality, um, counting between us centrality, etc., that try to address each of the key features, unique features of an IO network. Um, however, if you're trying to uh, find packages out there that um, exist in, say, Python or whatever language you're using, uh, they're not currently there yet, um, readily available for your own consumption. So at the moment, uh, you have what's being done is writing the, your own algorithm uh, from scratch, and that presents some challenges for uh, addressing these uh, more complicated measures or deriving these more complicated measures of centrality. However, as a start, um, we can start. We can begin with the uh, regularly used measures of centrality, as they already provide uh, enough use cases for addressing such um, problems or such research questions related to sustainability. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you, and hoping to get some uh, feedback and uh, yeah, feedback from you. Thank you once again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Angela. Uh, yeah, I think this is very intuitive. It is the first time I, I really um, uh, uh, heard, you know, uh, the presentation explain uh, the network and I/O uh, in such detail. Um, so now we open to Q and A. So we stop uh, recording. Um, so if uh,